So welcome everyone. Um, I think, should we give it just another minute to wait for stragglers to join in? Um, Okay, so um, welcome everybody. And uh, it looks like a lot of people have joined. So thank you for coming to the seminar um, where Christopher Williams will be talking about tornado sheltering before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, many of you probably already know Christopher because he's been at NCAR quite a bit. He, uh, he did his undergraduate degree at in the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences in Georgia Tech. Um, he finished that in 2008. But while working on that, he came to NCAR in 2007 as a SOARS protege. protege. Um, and then when he finished at Georgia Tech, he actually worked here at NCAR in the joint numerical testbed for many years. Um, and uh, now he he's left us, but he's, um, pursuing a doctoral degree at University of Florida. He actually just finished his master's degree there this past summer, um, and he's working with Kevin Ash, who, um, who is in the, he's one of the recipients of this new NCAR Innovator Program Awards. Um, and so Christopher is working with him on that project. Um, and also he returned during this pandemic year for the first ever um, virtual SOARS program, <laughs> I guess. Um, so maybe we didn't see him running around as much, but, <laughs> but he's been involved. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to you, Christopher. And uh, thanks again for uh, agreeing to give this talk. Thank you, Eric. And hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. This moment reminds me of the times when we'd gather in one of the conference rooms at FL2. Um, so I'm just really grateful for the opportunity uh, to, to give this seminar and um, to see so many friendly uh, and familiar faces as well as new ones. Although, you know, it's hard for me. I don't really see the faces um, and that's OK, but I know you all are present. Um, so thank you for the invitation to share our research with you today. For the past year or so now, uh, we examined tornado sheltering before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. We used quantitative and qualitative methods to explore survey responses and emergency management interviews. So this is a brief roadmap of where we are headed today. I'll talk about why we did the study, discuss data collection for the survey, give a brief overview of mapping and geospatial analysis and what we found there. I'll also highlight the interviews before giving some conclusions. Last spring, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. For the central and eastern US, the COVID-19 pandemic coincided with the onset of tornado season. Thinking about hazard specific protective behavior recommendations typically given by trusted authorities, which we show on the right, we can imagine the potential for conflict arises when these recommendations are taken at face value. For one, in response to the COVID-19, the recommendation is to create space by distancing from other people. And for tornadoes, the recommendation is to seek shelter in safer places, which often means congregating with other people. That leads me to our research question. 
How did group tornado sheltering and the COVID-19 pandemic intersect in terms of risk perception and intended protective behavior during spring 2020? So why do we care about the answer to this question? Past research has studied interactions between natural hazards and disease epidemics, mainly in a post-disaster context, such as when flooding leads to disease outbreaks. Our research angle seeks to advance scientific knowledge by studying concurrent hazards whose individually recommended responses may conflict when implemented at the same time. These advancements in knowledge may help drive practical improvements in emergency management services and risk communication. Some trusted authorities are already making headway in these areas. For example, the American Meteorological Society released a statement with guidelines for tornado sheltering during the COVID-19 pandemic. This statement includes specific calls to action and helpful information for the public. Another way our research is relevant is that we benefit from and build upon prior research. Examples include the Vortex Southeast campaign, where meteorologists, researchers, and social scientists gathered to better understand tornadoes and the disproportionate number of fatalities associated with them in the southeastern region of the US. Our work also relates to the literature in several ways. The citations listed here represent a few of the conceptual, theoretical, and empirical work we are building upon. Works like Tyranny 2019 discuss vulnerability and the potential for loss. Others like Schmidlin et al. 2009 and Ash et al. 2020 review tornadoes and the susceptibility associated with living in manufactured and mobile homes. The literature on COVID-19 is only beginning to emerge. Several early studies such as Quigley et al. 2020 and Collins et al. 2021 note the difficulties involved with concurrent or cascading crises, such as when severe weather outbreak or landfalling tropical cyclones occurred during the pandemic. This graphic reproduced from Schultz et al. 2020 highlights in red lettering the many places throughout the disaster cycle where protective actions taken by households and communities to mitigate harm from hurricanes may allow for the spread of COVID-19. To address our research question, we use data from an online research survey administered to members of the public in 20 US states from the 15th through the 28th of May in 2020. The survey research designers included states that typically experience maximum tornado activity during April and May. In addition, states from the southeastern US were included due to the heavier concentration of manufactured and mobile homes. The graphic highlights the 20 states sampled in the Qualtrics survey in dark gray. The sample includes 3,071 responses the survey covers a wealth of topics. While lots of data are available, what we're presenting represents a small portion and focuses on a particular set of questions that deal with tornado sheltering during COVID-19. We look at response differences by household characteristics, which in our case is housing type. The survey featured a seven point Likert type response skill Rather than asking respondents to categorically agree or disagree with statements, the Likert skill reveals information about their level of agreement or disagreement. One is strongly disagree, four is neither agree nor disagree, and seven is strongly agree. The tornado sheltering during COVID-19 survey topic includes responses for 11 individual statements or variables. Several of the 11 variables are closely related and are reflected as composite variables, which yields a total of seven dependent variables for our research. And we reflect those using these blank boxes. I'll show an example survey question statement and what the variable naming process looked like. So for example, survey participants were asked to respond to the statement, during the next few weeks, I am more concerned about protecting my household from tornadoes than from COVID-19. We could use this entire statement as the variable name, but that would become unwieldy. 
So in renaming the variables, we sought to strike a balance between conciseness and clarity. For the example here, we chose to name the variable more concerned tornadoes households to highlight the greater concern the statement places upon protecting a respondent's household from tornadoes than from COVID-19. This choice of variable name has at least one drawback owing to the exclusion of information about the general time frame, which in the full statement is indicated by the phrase during the next few weeks. So it's not perfect, but it gets us very close. So that's the process we applied to each variable. Let's step through the remaining dependent variables and I'll share, I'll share the survey statement or in the case of the composites, cluster concepts as we go. Slightly different than the first one, the next variable asked respondents to consider whether they are more concerned about protecting vulnerable people in their local area from COVID-19 than from tornadoes. The variables included in the shelter elsewhere composite all relate to where respondents prefer to seek shelter, like a public shelter or a shelter of friends and family or the sturdier home of friends and family. If tornadoes were to threaten, which points to people's comfort in group shelters. The turn shelter seeker the turn shelter seekers away variable turns the shelter elsewhere composite statements around and gauges whether survey participants are willing to host other people. The second composite, which we call reduced COVID-19 transmission risk, includes variables that ask participants to respond to the premise that different virus transmission risk reduction measures, like wearing a face mask, cutting building occupancy in half, or practicing six feet social distancing will increase their likelihood of using a public tornado shelter. The public shelter only option variable asks for responses to the statement, if public tornado shelters are closed due to COVID-19, there is nowhere else I can go to take shelter. And lastly, the unclear protection information variable sought participants' response to the statement, I think there is not clear enough communication from public officials about what people should do to protect themselves during tornado warnings while also protecting themselves from COVID-19. So going forward, I reuse these seven colors bordered by a rectangle with rounded corners as another way to help keep track of these survey variables in the analysis landscape. For the independent variable, we wanted a simple way to compare across housing types. So we stratified the housing types into two broad categories, less sturdy and more sturdy. Less sturdy includes mostly mobile and manufactured homes. More sturdy includes mostly single family homes and apartments or condos. We were motivated to focus on this collection of dependent variables and independent variable because of the disproportionately high tornado vulnerability of residents living in manufactured and mobile homes or structures. Using univariate analysis, we calculated descriptive statistics, including frequencies or histograms, mean, median, mode, ranges, and standard deviation to provide an overview of the dependent and independent variables. We used reliability statistics, or Cronbox Alpha, to test conceptually related dependent variables and formed a composite variable whenever alpha exceeded 0.7. We verified our considered t-test data and normality assumptions, and we ran multiple t-tests, which allowed us to test for a significant difference between the means of the less sturdy and more sturdy housing type groups. For the emergency management interviews, we established an interview protocol and was granted IRB approval. We asked semi-structured questions to better understand key stakeholder perspectives. These interviews were conducted via Zoom and each one lasted about 45 minutes. In total, we interviewed nine officials, which represents a 39% response rate. We then transcribed the interviews and conducted the thematic analysis. 
Some of the helpful software tools we used were SPSS, ArcGIS Pro, Zoom, and NVivo. So now let's talk about some of the results. This pertains to the research survey and it shows the dependent variables that I described earlier. And let me turn on the spotlight so you can uh, better see what section I'm referring to. Um, There we go. So in the first column, we show the means for all 3,071 responses. In this second column, we show the means for responses for people who indicated that they live in a less sturdy housing type structure. And then in this third column are the means for people who indicated they live in a more sturdy housing type structure. In the final column, we show whether or not the mean difference between the less sturdy and more sturdy groups is statistically significant at the 95% confidence level. The main takeaway is that considering the way the respondents answered, five of the variables showed a significant difference in the mean value when we compare the less sturdy to the more sturdy housing types. No, even though no statistically significant significant difference exists between the two housing type groups for the public shelter only option right here, or the think protection information on clear variable. These variables, variables still provide useful information. For example, over 1000 people in the survey sample indicated some level of agreement with the statement that if public tornado shelters are closed due to COVID-19, there is nowhere else they can go to take shelter, which represents an emergency response issue. So this is an example histogram pertaining to the think protection information unclear variable, which we wrote out in full on this slide. On the X axis, we have the Likert scale, which ranges from one to seven. One means strongly disagree, seven means strongly agree, and four means neither agree nor disagree. And on the y-axis, we show the number of participants that chose each scale rating in their response to the survey question. What we show from here is that a clear signal in responses, we show, we show there is a clear signal in responses that there was confusion in communication about how people should handle the concurrent hazards in 2020. Now moving on to the geospatial analysis, this graphic shows the daily average number of known COVID-19 cases per 100,000 residents from May 1st to May 28th in 2020. Using rates such as per capita, in this case expressed as per 100,000 residents, allows for better comparison across regions with different populations. So we can see that some regions with high case rates include Northern Louisiana and Southern Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, areas near Chicago and Northern Illinois, Omaha and Eastern Nebraska and Western Iowa, and portions of Southwestern Kansas going into the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles also reflect a higher average daily case incidence. Counties with lower case incidences at or below one per 100,000 cover large swaths of the central states from Nebraska to Texas and east to Missouri, Arkansas, and central Illinois. Numerous central Appalachian counties and a group of north central counties in Florida also reflect low case incidences around the survey time period. Now for the image on the right, this is for the Qualtrics survey. Each respondent provided a five digit postal zip code for their home. And the corresponding zip code tabulation area, or ZCTA, um, we plotted those centroids to provide information about the spatial distribution of the respondents. 
Note the dense clusters of respondents near several major urban areas like Atlanta and Dallas. On the other hand, respondent representation was scarce in areas like Western portions of the Great Plains states are in Southwestern Alabama and Middle Mississippi, which are areas whose county COVID-19 average daily new case incidences ranked among the highest, if you're looking at both of those images together. So now we're showing response means by state. We chose the shelter elsewhere composite here to illustrate what our process looked like. Um, notice the uh, legend on the left uh, shows the colors. Orange represents disagreement. White uh, represents neutral, uh, neither degree nor disagree. And the blue shading represents more agreement with the statement. So we can see how responses vary geographically. Um, regionally speaking, the more northern states tend to be less willing to think about sheltering elsewhere, whereas Florida is more willing to shelter elsewhere. Um, with this, we just wanted to talk about this in a broad way. Um, and so we wanted to focus on the regional values. Um, so now moving on to the emergency management interviews. Emergency managers serve on the front lines of disaster risk reduction, and they work with st stakeholders in the weather enterprise during all disaster life cycle phases. So we sought to listen and learn from their experience, uh, experiences and perspectives related to tornado sheltering during the COVID-19 pandemic. These are some of the uh, themes that emerged from our semi-structured interviews. We learned about the community uh, strengths and emergency management challenges, both for tornadoes and during COVID-19. And some of the more specific, specific areas that was talked about include vulnerability uh, factors, risk communication, and tornado shelters. And then during COVID-19, some things that emerged were centered around risk communication, partnerships, compound hazards and public sheltering, as well as staff safety concerns. One of the things that stood out to me was how vital partnerships are in the emergency management field. One interviewee said, I cannot overemphasize the need for relationships and partnerships. That's the key building relationships across the community involving in what I call community engagement. This sentiment was echoed by many of the officials we interviewed. They frequently talked, for instance, about the role of faith-based organizations and civic organizations in their communities for providing shelter. When asked to describe changes in the willingness or resistance of community organizations and partners to host individuals, seeking shelter from tornadoes during COVID-19, emergency managers spoke very highly and understandingly of their partners. Yet, they faced challenges for a variety of reasons, including protecting volunteers and for liability issues. One interviewee said, so we just had to get creative with finding other locations and do the whole process fingers. I hope nothing happens. This illustrates how emergency managers do what they need to do to get the job done using the resources that are, in their, are at their disposal. We also wanted to know about changes in the way people behave inside public shelters during COVID-19. One interviewee said, we did find that people sat in their cars at the shelter and did not come in until the warning was issued. It's like, yeah, we got 20 cars out here. We got 30 cars, but they're not coming in until they have to. This demonstrates how people were aware in responding to both hazards. In turn, it illustrates how emergency managers may need to modify their protocols to account for this changed behavior. For example, they may need to make a point of going outside to alert people of imminent weather risk and to come inside if they are waiting in their cars.
We also noticed how the flow of information faced stress tests and improvements during COVID-19 and severe weather events. One emergency manager talked about the improvement that resulted from interacting with the National Weather Service virtually rather than, it, than in person during severe weather. Another emergency manager shared how misinformation and the lack of support for science from the federal level made best practice adoption at the local level more difficult. Then there is this quote. There were still a lot of questions in regards to how the virus spread and a lot of unknowns and we were on lockdown. So we had to not only work with the National Weather Service but with the state health department in regards to where to where telling people to stay at home. So does that mean they don't shelter if their shelter isn't in their home? What do they do? This illustrates how emergency managers were faced with uncertainty in adjusting their protocols during COVID-19. Not all the emergency managers responded in the same way. For example, this particular emergency manager shared messaging that emphasized protecting oneself from the immediate threat to life, which could be a tornado even during COVID-19, and noted ways to mitigate exposure, exposure to COVID-19 in shelters. Yet another emergency manager talked about their decision-making process and how they did not open tornado shelters under any circumstances during what they understood would be the height of COVID-19. So what did we learn? We found, we found people prioritized on average COVID-19 over tornadoes. When stratifying responses based on individuals housing type vulnerability, we learned those living in less sturdy structures like mobile homes, manufactured homes and tiny homes saw relatively more risk from tornadoes than COVID-19 and expressed intended protective behaviors accordingly. Interviews with emergency management personnel in the Southeastern US provided more nuance. For example, people adapted their process for assessing public tornado shelters to wait in vehicles outside until it was absolutely necessary to go inside. However, this behavior also risked the possibility of being caught outside rather than safe inside a shelter. We also learned that some partnerships for providing additional safer locations for people to shelter from tornadoes were strained or temporarily broken due, due to COVID-19 risk and logistical difficulties. The early days of the COVID-19 pandemic in spring 2020 were full of uncertainty. And this was reflected in both the survey results with members of the public and in interview results with emer emergency management officials. Survey respondents overwhelmingly indicated they viewed compound hazard protection information as lacking clarity. The need for accurate information and coordination also rose to the fore in our interviews with emergency management officials. In addition, we learned about the zeal emergency managers exude for the communities they serve, their professional proficiency in networked operations, and the importance of simultaneously addressing social and physical dimensions as a part of human-centered emergency management. We also enjoyed exploring different aggregation and visualization techniques in the preliminary geospatial analyses. Um, we did not get to show all the results, such as from the finer scale hexagonal tessellation analysis. This graphic is a tessellation grid showing the number of survey respondents in each hexagon. The preliminary analysis suggests regional and intrastate variations for the different variables we examined. For example, we found that compared to Midwestern and North Central Plain states, Respondents in Southern and Southeastern states exhibited slightly more willingness to engage in group tornado sheltering behaviors. This research project addressed the sliver of the possibilities afforded by the overlap of the survey data set and current knowledge gaps. So some things that we'd like to do 
is to continue the research for peer reviewed publication. We'd like to incorporate the July, um, a second survey instrument that was fielded in July 2020. For some of the geospatial analyses, we want to conduct cluster analyses and consider more of the state and local variances of shelter in place information. We also would like to evaluate other socio demographic independent variables. Some of them are shown on the right. Um, some things that are of particular interest are like the political affiliation. Um, um, some of the limitations include the small response mean differences and some small unit sample sizes. Um, so I'd like to take time to acknowledge the valuable contributions and support of my thesis committee the research support provided by these individuals and four institutions. I also wanna thank SOARS and my mentors in 2020 and beyond. I also like to say thank you to all of my teachers, coworkers, just everyone who's had a hand in uh, helping with this research and um, my time at NCAR uh, before starting the graduate program here at UF. Um, I have many mentors and uh, friends and uh, fond memories. So I just wanna say, a very big heartfelt thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Yes, and I was supposed to say, if you want to ask a question, you can either enter it in the chat um, or we have the Slido. So if you're watching on the live stream, there should be um, a link to the Slido. Uh, and if not, there's really no way for me to, <laughs> to know that at this point. Um, so uh, at the moment, I don't see any questions in either one. I did um, just add a, an announcement that the next Ryle seminar is coming up next Wednesday, October 6. Uh, I believe it's at one. Let me just check. Yes, 1 to 2 p.m. And that's going to be Stefan Rahimi um, talking about dynamical downscaling and climate change. What the heck are we looking at? Um, oh, yes, and you can raise your hand also if you, if you just want to speak instead of typing into the chat. Um, no waiting currently. So I have one question um, while we wait to see if there are any others. So Christopher, at some point you showed differences in means using the a, the a t test of some sort. Um, is and but that's on these categories, right? Like the differences between the mean response from the one to seven, is, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, you know, one thing that I thought of with that is, um, you know, the, the data are very categorical and, um, you know, the one to seven is somewhat of an arbitrary, you know, choice and values for that. So you might consider looking at um, some kind of categorical measure, you know, like a there's something called a power divergence statistic, um, which has some more well-known um, statistics as special cases. So for example, the Pearson chi-square test um, and uh, the likelihood ratio test, different things. Um, but it's basically, it measures the difference in um, percentages that you get in each of those categories in, instead of an arbitrary you know, intensity value that you put. Um, so you might get, it might, I don't know, it might be interesting to see, you, you might get more um, significant responses that way or, or maybe less, <laughs> depending. Thank you for that suggestion, Eric. Yeah. So I'm just scanning to see if there are any hands raised. There are a few questions in Slido. Ah, okay. So, um, do you want to go ahead and uh, 
I think that was Lisa who said it. So Lisa, do you want to go ahead? And... Yes. Um, this one comes from Chris. Do you have any idea whether preference might have, whether preference might have shifted during tornado season 2021? Ah, in 2021. Mm. That's a good, thank you for that question. Um, I haven't looked at, in 2021, I don't know, it's a short answer. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All right, the next question comes from Mariana. Uh, when interviewing the emergency managers, did any of them discuss the challenge or need for delegation when managing both a public health issue and natural health hazard at the same natural hazard at the same time? Let me think about that. You know, they did talk a lot about our uh, a number of the emergency managers talked about the importance of uh, like teamwork and helping uh, different areas out. So perhaps um, an emergency management for one specific area in a state would come to the aid of an emergency management agency in another, in a different state or another portion of the same state. Um, I don't recall them talking about necessarily delegation. Um, although many of the emergency managers, whether they uh, represented a small uh, jurisdiction or a large jurisdiction, they, they a lot of them said that they wore multiple hats. Um, so that was a commonality. Um, and they definitely did talk about how having uh, the compounding hazards did make uh, running the tornado shelters more difficult. Um, so I don't know if that addresses your question directly, but that's, that's, those are my thoughts regarding it. Thank you for that question. So before we go to the next Slido question, I, we have a question from Morris uh, in the chat. And he says, would it make sense to also divide the group into those who did experience a tornado warning and those that didn't? Yes, I think that's a, another uh, great suggestion. And you know, we did, um, there are additional questions in that survey from May, 2020. And um, so those are things that we, we would like to look at. Um, and my advisor, Kevin Ash, um, already has done additional analysis on it. And so um, I don't have the results for that um, here, but thank you for that suggestion. Um, that's something that we, we uh, definitely intend to do. The next question in Slido comes from Chris. Great talk, thanks. Have you thought about layering on information about the tornado exposure risks for the specific regions respondents are in? Yes, um, we've thought about those uh, doing that as well. Um, for example, we'd like to, we noticed in some of the geospatial analysis, um, are we pondered, hypothesized, um, whether it's past experiences, notable experiences, whether that could account for some of the patterns that we're seeing. Um, I remember in one of the geospatial analysis, Ohio, um, the responses in Ohio differed um, somewhat from the states surrounding states. And there was a notable tornado event that occurred in Ohio, and we hypothesized whether or not that impacted uh, people's responses. Um, we also noticed there were some differences like in Florida. Um, and we thought, especially South Florida, and we were thinking that perhaps uh, people who live in that region of the state are not as uh, familiar with tornadoes or tornado sheltering. Um, and perhaps also people in that part of the state may have more economic resources. And so maybe that impacted the way that they responded um, or expressed their intended protective behaviors. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. And the next question comes from Hugh. A uh, great talk, Christopher. I'm curious if you can speculate about why you might be seeing geographical differences. Is that likely to be political identity motivated or are there other mechanisms that you would propose? Um, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, I think that's also somewhat related to uh, what, um, to the question that Chris had just asked. Um, I also, I'd add on to that, that 
one thing we don't know, um, but may have a significant impact on the patterns that we're observing is which states, uh, different approaches that states took for communicating um, about the compound hazards. Um, and we think that differences in states are um, individual trusted authorities, uh, methods or approaches for communicating risk um, could have a significant impact on the geographical differences that we, patterns that we were noticing. Um, definitely, again, I think uh, looking at past uh, tornado experiences, lived experiences could make a big impact on different geographical differences and patterns that we're seeing as well. Um, as far as political identity, um, Yes, that's, that's why, um, one reason why I mentioned that particular uh, independent variable that we have information in, in the survey about that and we'd uh, like to look at that more. Um, we didn't look at it as a part of this research uh, study, but the data are there, are available. And so that's something we'd like to do in future research. Um, I know at least uh, one of the emergency uh, management, uh, emergency managers talked about political affiliation and how that impacted um, the emergency management side of things. So thank you for bringing that up as well. Now the next question comes from Chris again. Um, you mentioned adding in a July 2020 survey. What would you? What do you expect to change between waves? That's a great question. Whew. Um, you know, things were evolving rapidly. Um, and in the COVID-19 pandemic last, last year, the region that was included for the May 2020 survey uh, was the central and eastern US. And so the same uh, geographic area was covered in the July 2020 survey. However, the July 2020 survey also included some more of the more northern states where that typically experience their maximum tornado um, activity later in the summer around the July timeframe. So um, in terms of what do I expect to change? You know, I, I would be uh, interested to see this uh, one of the most outstanding or stark results in the May 2020 survey was the number of people who expressed or, or agreed with the statement that the information coming from public uh, channels um, was unclear or lacked clarity. So I wonder if in the July 2020 survey, um, whether more people would, uh, if, whether that sentiment would continue or if people would feel like the information they were receiving from public channels about how to protect themselves from both tornadoes and COVID-19, whether that information would have become more clear. My guess is that uh, the information was, would still be unclear and that would be a, a continued signal, but it'd be interesting to see. Um, another, another interesting thing I'd say, um, people, whether they live in the, uh, in more sturdy housing types or less sturdy housing types, um, they tended to agree that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was, our COVID-19 was a bigger threat than tornadoes. Um, so in the July 2020 um, data set, given that that's further along in the tornado season, I wonder if, um, and given that there was more time for authorities to talk about um, continuing to go to a tornado shelter, even during the pandemic. Um, I'm wondering if that will change, if pe more people will say that tornadoes are a bigger threat, um, particularly if they live in a manufactured or mobile health um, home. Thank you for that question. That's all the questions we have in Slido, Christopher. Thank you so much. And I just scanned to see if there were any hands raised and, and I don't see any um, and I don't see any further questions in the chat, just uh, compliments. Um, 
So the one thing, uh, if there's anyone from M cubed, because this was a joint RAL and cube seminar, um, you know, I advertised um, our next seminar. Um, if anybody from M cubed wanted to advertise the next one there, I, I don't have a link for, for those seminars handy, so. Um, so if not, then um, we can thank Christopher again. It was a very interesting and, and well made talk. And um, uh, I appreciate your willingness, Christopher, again, to, to uh, take the time to give us the seminar. And thanks. Yeah. Thank so, you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Yeah.